Welcome back, everybody, and welcome to the first of two sessions of Under the Dome. Now, Under the Dome, we've done for about 10 years at AKP because it introduces patients to those who are working here in Washington and around the country in some of the toughest roles, trying to advance innovation in payment models and in care models, uh, new devices, new diagnostics, and new drugs. But on this first session of Under the Dome at this national patient meeting, we're focused on issues and policies impacting transplantation. And we have a great first speaker on this session, and that's Dr. Steve Potter, who serves as the Professor of Surgery and Urology and the Director of the Pancreas Transplantation Program at MedStar Georgetown Transplant Institute here in Washington, DC. He also serves as the Chair of the American Society of Transplant Surgeons Legislative and Regulatory Committee, where I work with him regularly. Dr. Potter is very passionate about patients. He is what we would call a true anchored and centered patient-centric advocate. And that's a lot of language to basically say this. He knows the details, he knows policy, he knows medical practice, and throughout all of it, he never forgets what a patient needs to make certain that they can live and reach their aspirations. It's a real pleasure to have him. Dr. Potter, go right ahead. We're very interested in your session. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, AKP, for having me. It's a really an enormous honor to present at your 48th annual National Patient Meeting. I'm going to talk today on behalf of the American Society of Transplant Surgeons, or ASTS, about our proposed Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation Demonstration Project on increasing access and reducing disparities in kidney transplantation. I have no disclosures of any relevance, uh, and I am speaking on behalf of the American Society of Transplant Surgeons today. So this just shows our CMMI demonstration project leadership team. And these are our committee members, uh, gathered uh, subject matter experts from around the country from multiple transplant centers. Our initial proposal to CMMI was to create a national demonstration project incentivizing transplant programs to increase their kidney transplant volumes. The demonstration participants would form kidney transplant collaborators under this model and a kidney transplant collaborative would have consisted of a participating OPO and the participating transplant centers, dialysis facilities, and nephrologists in that OPO's donor service area or the geographic area covered by that organ procurement organization. The goal of this project was to increase the number of deceased donor transplants performed relative to historic baselines at those participating centers. So as I said, the goal was to do more transplants and the participants in this would be incentivized to do that in two major ways. The first would be financial incentives, and this would be a portion of shared cost savings paid to the collaborative members for transplants performed that exceeded historic baselines. The estimated savings would be based on projected Medicare cost savings that result from doing more transplants relative to having more patients stay on dialysis. The second big incentive, incentive component would be regulatory waivers, and that would be waivers of some OPTN performance metrics and SRTR star ratings for participating centers. The purpose of that would be to decrease the risk aversion of some of the decision making involved in accepting high risk candidates and putting them on the wait list and transplanting those patients and in accepting high risk kidneys. CMMI ultimately declined to partner with us on this proposed structure. Now the environment changed over the next couple of years and we decided to try again. So in June 2022, we proposed a revised demonstration project to CMMI. How would the environment change in the meantime? Well, the OPTN organ allocation systems had been modified significantly to increase organ sharing in a, on a broader geographic basis, and that increased the complexity of deceased donor organ allocation and transportation. COVID-19 had increased public awareness of healthcare disparities. The Biden administration had identified the reduction of healthcare disparities as a major healthcare policy objective. And the National Academy of Science Engineering and Medicine report, the NASM report, emphasized that the most significant disparity in transplantation was the disparity in access of candidates to living donor kidneys. <clears throat> so our revised proposal was focused on living donor transplantation and the reduction in those disparities. It was built on the same foundation I described with our original proposal. It would include financial incentives via shared cost savings for transplants exceeding historic volume baselines and it would include regulatory waivers as needed to facilitate increases in access to living donor transplantation and reduction in disparities. This proposal was more focused and will be easier to implement. 
So let's step back a little bit and look at living donor kidney transplantation in terms of its clinical advantages. And, and that really explains why we felt it was such a valuable target um, for a demonstration project. As you can see, the, the green uh, bars are graft survival over time at one year, three year, and five years for recipients of living donor kidneys. And the blue bars are the recipients of deceased donor kidneys. And you see that a remarkable 98% of kidneys that are placed uh, from living donors into recipients are still functioning at a year. And you see that the advantage for living donor kidney transplantation is preserved at every time point, and the difference in outcome between living donor recipient and deceased donor recipients widens as time goes on. So now let's look at patient survival over time. The same layout in terms of the slide, but now we're looking at the patient survival rather than graft survival. And you can see that a remarkable 99% of the recipients of living donor kidneys are alive one year after transplant relative to a little over 96% for recipients of deceased donor kidney transplants. And those differences continue to widen over time, and the, the relative benefit of living donor kidney receipt is preserved over time. Living donor kidney transplantation also carries some significant financial advantages for the recipients of those organs and for the payers, primarily CMS, that pay for the transplants. So it's well established that kidney transplantation is the most cost-effective therapy for ESRD. And relative to deceased donor kidney transplantation, living donor kidney transplantation is associated with significant cost savings. Potential sources of those savings include a markedly lower uh, rate of delay graft function after transplant and the avoidance of associated dialysis charges and decreased cost for hospitalizations and rehospitalizations after transplant. It provides societal benefit through improved productive capacity for the patients who receive those transplants. For example, more people able to re-enter the workforce and uh, live healthier, longer lives. Longer graft and patient survival we kind of reviewed in the last couple of slides. There's a marked difference relative to deceased donor transplantation. And it's also critical to note that every living donor kidney transplant frees up a deceased donor organ that can then be used in another recipient who has no access to a living donor kidney. So essentially a, raising, a rising tide can raise all the boats in this situation. So let's take a look at living donor kidney transplant trends. The blue purplish line at the top shows you the change in volume for deceased donor transplants in this country. And you see that we've really done a remarkable job over the last decade of year over year, every year, increasing the number of deceased donor kidney transplants that are done. I think that's a remarkable story. But if you look at the lower line, that's living donor kidney transplants, and you see that that number has really been stagnant. That drop off at the very end is likely primarily a function of COVID. Uh, the pandemic shut down a lot of living donor kidney programs for a while. But overall, the trend has been one of stagnation, not of growth. And if we look at it a little bit differently, and if we look at it a little bit differently with this histogram that goes out to 2021, you see that this, on the far right in green, the number of living donor transplants done improved a little bit as we emerged from the pandemic, but really hasn't changed significantly from this baseline of the last you know, 20 years or so. So clearly we need to do a better job there. Now let's look at disparities in terms of who living uh, do kidney donors are. The racial and ethnic composition of living donors in this country uh, in 2020 was about 71.5% uh, white, 15% Hispanic, and it's about 7.3% African American or black donors. Note the ongoing decline in the proportion of black living donors, which formed 8.7% of the living donor pool in 2019 and was 12% as recently as 2010. Our revised proposal to CMMI, which with its focus on living donor transplantation and reduction in disparities, had many advantages relative to the previous model we proposed. It does not require forming new collaboratives. Participants are individual transplant programs. Participants are able to create informal networks with referring nephrologists, dialysis centers, and others to facilitate early referral and rapid evaluation and listing. And it requires a focus on effective patient education on the living donor process and who can be a candidate to donate a kidney. It focuses on an area of transplantation where the disparities are most profound, and it would not be affected by anticipated significant changes in deceased donor organ allocation. If successful, though, this could be expanded to include deceased donor transplants as well. So CMMI was interested in this revised model, but wanted a deceased donor component added to it, 
So again, we revise our proposal. So this brings us to our current model that's in evolution with CMMI, which is incentivizing transplant programs to increase deceased and living donor transplantation. Built on the same foundation as the model we just talked about, it establishes volume baselines and pays a portion of shared cost savings for those transplants exceeding the baseline. Those shared savings would be a portion of the savings relative to patients being on dialysis. It would require regulatory waivers, particularly from MPSC and some SRTR star ratings metrics, as necessary to facilitate an increase in access to living donor transplantation and to facilitate more aggressive organ acceptance practices and the listing of higher risk kidney candidates. So this proposed demonstration project, again, has a simple structure. It doesn't require uh, elaborate collaboratives to be formed. Individual transplant programs would be the participants. And it allows individualized incentives and, and targeting uh, of goals. Transplant centers under this model have the discretion to focus on living donor transplantation, deceased donor transplantation, or both in order to meet targets within the model. And it minimizes the impact of future changes in deceased donor allocation because of that component of living donation. So increasing living donor kidney transplantation, what are some of the actions transplant programs can take in this model? They need to develop multiple approaches for education of potential donors and for education of patients with CKD and ESRD. And they have to have early and repeated exposure to those educational resources. And those educational resources have to be designed for all audiences and tailored for them, not just a one size fits all sort of approach, which is kind of the common approach. We need improved communication between transplant centers and dialysis centers to facilitate early referral of patients and to advocate for living donation from the very beginning. And we need regulatory metrics relief to waive recipient but not living donor outcomes metrics jeopardy for high risk recipients of living donor organs. So when you think back to the previous slide and you realize that 99% of living donor kidney recipients are alive one year after transplant and you remember that the current MPSC and SRTR metrics compare transplant programs against each other, you can see how it becomes a risk averse environment for a transplant program when they see a candidate who has a potential living donor and who wants to get a transplant, but is a high risk, that center may be too risk averse to list that candidate. And we, we don't agree with that and we'd like to see that environment change so that more people can have access to transplantation in general and living donor kidney transplantation in particular. So in terms of deceased donor kidney transplantation in this model, what are some of the actions transplant programs can take? First and foremost, accept more organ offers. Modifying practice patterns for deceased donor organ offer acceptance may dramatically increase deceased donor transplant numbers. The observed variability in organ offer acceptance rates around the country is simply too large. And modifying practice patterns may also decrease rates of non-utilization or discard of procured but transplantable kidneys. We'd also like to see improved communication between transplant centers and OPOs to facilitate offer acceptance, organ, transplant, uh, organ uh, transportation, and transplantation. What other actions can transplant programs take? Well, we're really focused on, the, on decreasing that risk-averse organ acceptance decision-making by transplant centers and by waitlist candidates who are offered those organs. So we need to educate candidates. I can tell you that increasingly I'm hearing from my peers and I'm seeing myself when, I, when I'm trying to place uh, high-risk kidneys, that candidates often turn down organs that would be very beneficial for them. So we need to educate them about their options with dialysis as really the comparator group. In other words, is, it, is this type of kidney going to be better for you than staying on dialysis? And candidates need to know their doctor's approach to high-risk deceased donor kidneys in advance. They need and deserve to know why accepting these kidneys is a good idea. We also need to expand candidate selection criteria and we really feel like if patients are likely to benefit from a transplant, even if they face higher risk of complications, they deserve to be transplanted. We've talked about incentives and how we structure those. So this model would provide financial incentives for increasing living donor transplantation and encouraging centers to invest in that area. It would provide financial incentives for increases in proportion of living donor transplants that are performed for historically underserved recipient populations and will provide financial incentives for increasing the proportion of historically disadvantaged groups that are receiving transplants. So this just briefly summarizes our timeline to date. We started with this revised model in June of 2022, and we've been actively working with and meeting with CMMI since that time. Our last meeting was uh, last week, in fact, 
uh, and um, we are excited about their offer of having us move forward with a uh, with a more firmed up model, a more detailed model. So things are going in the right direction, and I hope to have more to report to you down the road. So what conclusions can we reach? We must transplant more patients in need. We must decrease persistent disparities in access to living donor kidneys. We must reverse the stagnation in living donor kidney transplant volumes. And we must decrease the non-utilization or discard of potentially transplantable procured kidneys. We've also learned that if a potential solution isn't working, we need to try a new solution. And I think our, most of our moms told us something that was very true. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. So decreasing risk-averse candidate listing and organ acceptance practices is really critically important. We feel that combining financial incentives from shared cost savings and regulatory relief uh, in terms of the relief from misguided performance metrics can be used to produce changes in behavior at transplant centers and drive substantive and substantial increases in transplant volume and a significant decrease in observed disparities. We hope to partner with CMMI in creating a national demonstration project to achieve these goals, and we've been wor working very hard and diligently towards that, and ASTS will continue to fight to advance patient access to transplantation. Well, I want to thank AAKP for uh, allowing me to speak on behalf of ASTS today. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you very much, Dr. Potter. Uh, that's an excellent presentation, and we're very interested uh, in this model that you've proposed. Can you tell me uh, I got a couple of different questions for you. So the first one is, uh, what type of regulatory relief or waivers would be needed for transplant centers uh, participating in this model? What would be the most helpful? This is a critically important question, Paul, because it's vitally important for patients. At ASTS, we believe that outcomes measures have become a double-edged sword for the transplant community. We're all staunch advocates of patient safety, and we work diligently to advance every safety initiative but we also want to see more patients transplanted. And when you compare transplant center outcomes to transplant center outcomes, you can lose sight of the most important thing, which is, is transplantation better than dialysis? And the answer unequivocally is yes. And so we'd like to see uh, a decrease in the type of onerous regulatory metrics that create risk averse decision making on the part of transplant centers and that potentially can lead to high risk organs being discarded and high risk candidates uh, not being listed for transplant. Thanks, Dr. Potter. And I've got another question for you, which is this, and I know a lot of patients ask this and may not really understand it, but can you tell me why some transplant centers are so much more conservative, I guess, in, in their approach with organ acceptance practice than others? That's a great question, Paul, and it's a tough one. We don't expect or even want to eliminate all the observed variability and practice pattern differences uh, in uh, organ acceptance practices around the country. After all, the professionals at a transplant center are best positioned to understand their local patient population, their local access to deceased donor organs, and the areas of expertise of their own center. However, there is way too much variability in organ offer acceptance practices around the nation. And we need to continue efforts at encouraging those centers that, are, that routinely decline transplantable organs to be a bit more aggressive with their acceptance uh, practice patterns. And we need to encourage centers to continue to be aggressive or be more aggressive with listing candidates who would benefit from transplantation, but who are clearly biologically at higher risk uh, of complications after transplant. Thanks, Dr. Potter, for your answer. And it kind of begs a follow-up question, which is this. Um, can you talk about how important it is to allow some flex to remain in the system uh, at the transplant center level for transplant surgeons, as opposed to uh, trying to mandate inflexible national outcomes for every single center? Good question, Paul. Having national metrics and outcome threshold is actually really good. We're not advocating for different outcome thresholds at every center or for different outcome thresholds for different regions of the country. But I do think we need to refocus the outcomes debate a little bit. We should remember that our goal is to rescue patients from organ failure and to add quality of life and years of life. Comparing kidney transplant outcomes to dialysis outcomes is more relevant than comparing all the transplant centers in the country to each other. Grading kidney transplant centers against each other, particularly when the differences in outcomes between centers are typically not clinically significant, does not help patients and it obscures the fact that all the transplant centers in the country are providing an option in transplantation 
that is dramatically superior to dialysis. Thanks for answering the question, Dr. Potter. And I have another one for you. Assuming that the model works and more people get transplanted, what can we do to help maximize the longevity of the transplanted kidneys that are out there? Well, Paul, getting more people transplanted is our primary strategic goal, but it goes without saying that we need to continue to provide the highest quality care and maintain good outcomes for those who are transplanted. You know, long-term outcomes in this country have not improved enough over the years, and it's a rare area where the transplant community has failed to make huge progress over the last several decades. The way we monitor kidney function in patients who are transplanted may be playing a critical role. Until recently, we'd been performing surveillance of transplanted kidneys in essentially the same fashion for two or three decades, which is really unbelievable. And we know now that there's a better way. The big potential change is the availability of molecular testing to get an early indicator of kidney allograft injury or rejection. The use of these techniques, including donor-derived cell-free DNA and gene expression profiling, have the potential to remake the landscape for kidney transplant surveillance and may dramatically improve long-term outcomes for recipients. Just to circle back on our strategic goal of increasing the number of transplants, Paul, remember that if folks keep their organs longer, they don't need another kidney transplant. So improving long-term outcomes through better surveillance using cell-free DNA, for example, is great for transplant recipients, obviously, but also of great benefit for candidates on the waiting list because every recipient that does not need a repeat transplant frees up a kidney for another candidate in need. Thanks, Dr. Potter, for the generosity of your time. One final question for you. Do you think the time is now for the next generation of transplant drugs? And more importantly, do you think the time is now for FDA to adopt a new co-primary endpoint in order to jumpstart innovation in the transplant drug space? Patients are really interested in drugs that are less nephrotoxic and we're interested in drugs with less side effects. I say that as a transplant patient who's taken over 160,000 pills, and I'm interested in your insights on what the future could be. Thank you. Paul, that's a great question, and the short answer is yes, it is time for the FDA to adopt a new co-primary endpoint. ASTS, AST, and ITS, the International Transplantation Society, all believe that we need to change the way we approve new transplant-related drugs and we've achieved consensus that the approach you just outlined in your question is a good first step. The Transplant Therapeutic Cons Consortium, TTC, has done amazing work for years moving this forward. One of the central problems with evaluating new drugs in transplantation and in getting them approved is that our outcomes are actually so good. So if you have 98 or 99% one-year patient survival after a kidney transplant, that's wonderful, but it means that it's almost mathematically impossible to demonstrate that an investigational drug is superior to the current standard of care. Using iBox as a primary, uh, using iBox as a co-primary endpoint allows us to use the iBox modeling system to better predict five-year outcomes, and that will give us the leverage we need to show that investigational drugs are promising or even superior to standard of care. And Paul, just to show how topical this is, the proposal to use a co-primary endpoint in drug evaluation was submitted to the FDA just this last July, and a ruling from the FDA is expected in the first half of next year. Thank you very much, Dr. Potter, for joining us for Under the Dome, and uh, we will be working very closely with you, as you know. Our next speaker is Dr. Rosalind Mannon, and Dr. Mannon serves as the Vice Chair of Research at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. We know her quite well from her work with the Transplant Therapeutics Consortium, the American Society of Transplant Surgeons, as well as the American Society of Nephrology. She's very well recognized in the field as an expert in the types of things that impact patients before and during and after a kidney transplant. She's the author of over 220 peer-reviewed medical journals, and she's a recipient of the Trailblazer Award in Clinical Transplantation from the Transplant Therapeutics Consortium. She's been a staunch advocate for making certain that the next generation of transplant medicines is seen in our lifetime, not in another 10 years. She's very passionate. She's been involved with FDA and many federal agencies representing the patient viewpoint on the need for innovation. Dr. Manning, go right ahead. It's so great to have you. Thanks, Paul, for this wonderful opportunity and for the American Association of Kidney Patients to invite me to the 48th annual 
uh, national patient meeting. It's really an honor for me to be here today to talk about drug development and kidney transplantation. And my title is It's Happening, and that's what we'll be talking about. These are my disclosures. It's important to point out that I am a member of the steering committee for the Transplant Therapeutic Consortium, and I will be talking about some of their work today. So many of you are familiar and have a journey within transplantation, but I don't think a figure encapsulates that journey as well as this figure. This is uh, from the Human uh, Centered uh, Design Subcommittee of the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients. This figure was created in order to help us identify the different stops and perhaps starts in a patient's journey to have a kidney transplant. And you'll notice the center line, the patient in the turquoise is the center of this operation. And some of you live in big cities, so you appreciate the complexity of a subway map. But in general, I think having this kind of figure helps us understand um, how to get patients transplanted and how to maximize their outcomes. So along those lines, I'd like to highlight some of the unmet needs in kidney transplantation. And first and foremost is access to transplant that's equitable. And as we know, there are many inconsistent listing requirements across transplant centers. There is an inability to multi-list because people don't have unlimited resources in terms of ability to leave their job or have the money to travel or even go those long distances. And there are many difficulties in completing all the steps in a transplant evaluation process that might include cardiac testing, cancer surveillance, and the like. Another critical unmet need in our field is the lack of sufficient donor organs. And we've tried to address that in as a field with new allocation schemes. I'm not sure those are entirely helping us because we have a higher rate of kidneys that aren't being utilized. We have expanded what we would consider as a reasonable kidney to utilize, which is much different than when my career started using individuals with so-called high KDPI. Those are individuals that are older and have different diseases. And we've maximized living donation by using pair donation programs, whether they're within a center alone or by a national program. And many of you have heard that we're trying to expand this supply of donor organs by using genetically modified pigs. And maybe the vision of the future is having these animals available in specific farms to be able to provide organs to the human population. But I'll be spending my time talking about therapeutic unmet needs. You know, we have been trying to personalize immunosuppressive therapy for all of our patients. And it's important to note that post-transplant, we've not done a great job of managing the increased risk of cardiovascular disease. These disease risks actually are exacerbated by current immunosuppressive therapies. And we haven't really adequately addressed the side effects of these therapies. You know, the goal really is to promote patient adherence and physician adherence to the way the drug should be used. But when patients have side effects, we really need to modify our therapy. And finally, there has been a terrible lack of new drug development, as I'll demonstrate in my next slides. And we have an opportunity to address death-censored graft failure with therapeutic efficacy. And some examples that some of you may be suffering from are BK virus nephropathy, delayed graft function, and importantly, antibody-mediated injury. So when I started, um, I was very inspired in the, at the turn of the century in 2002 by this review by Flavio Vincenti. He highlighted about 15 new agents that were coming into transplantation, a large pipeline, a robust pipeline. And he identified this pipeline as providing opportunities for more stable kidney transplant function, even lower rates of rejection than current therapy, and the avoidance of calcineurin inhibitors, tacrolimus and cyclosporin, that over long-term periods of use can lead to allograft, uh, to graft failure through fibrosis and atrophy, just a side effect of the toxicity of the drug long-term. But within about six years, the grim reality set in. Uh, again, Dr. Vincenti, team with Dr. Kirk, identified that the first part of this millennium had been really disappointing, that none of the agents listed in that review progressed into clinical trials, including quite a number that seemed very promising in preclinical animal models. And there were a number of agents that were in clinical trials, as noted below. But the vast majority ended up here, and unfortunately, this is a terrible slide to show, but it's really the transplant therapeutic cemetery. 
And many of these agents never really came to fruition in transplant patients. They may be marketed now as agents for autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis, but the drug companies did not develop them and get them FDA approved for transplantation. And why was that? Well, part of the problem is noted in this paper was that the success of existing immunosuppressive regimens, the things we use currently, which have been in use for more than 20 years, could hinder the future drug development because the vanishing primary endpoint of acute rejection um, has, has really gotten quite small. And it's been also very challenging to show that any new therapy can improve long-term graft outcome, which is a key goal in therapeutic management of our patients. When you look at the most recent new drug approvals, it's terribly shocking to see that the only novel agent that's been approved was Neologix or Bilatacept, and that was 12 years ago. And really in the past decade, the only things beyond that that have been approved are sort of long acting versions of Tecrolimus. So we really have been stagnating in terms of providing new therapies to our patients. Um, this is not a, sort of a new concept. It's actually something that I've been dwelling upon for the last decade and uh, collaboratively with the American Society of Transplant Surgeons and the Transplantation Society, we developed uh, this document, a personal viewpoint, why there are barriers in therapeutic development. And first and foremost, I would say that there's a general barrier that within the field, there has been a misconception that what we're doing now is acceptable and can't be made any better. And that also we're in a culture of risk aversion, that we're very metric oriented and we don't want to mess with something that's, that's working well. But I want to point out that when you think about kidney patient survival, you need to think about it in the larger longitudinal terms of other common diseases. When you look at overall kidney transplant survival in the black, you can see that the level of patient survival over five years is not unlike that of some common malignancies. Now, I can tell you that when I went in this field, I chose not to go into oncology. I was really fascinated by nephrology and I thought we were making major advances, but I never thought that I would be considering that patients who have a transplant that return to dialysis or patients who are standing on the waiting list with weightless mortality, I never really ever considered within myself that we're really facing a desperate situation. And so I challenge the field to indicate that we are not doing as well as we think and that we can do better. There's also this challenge of long-term graft survival. And I think that recent data have been encouraging whether you look at living donor survival in the curves at the top on the left or deceased donor on the right, you can see that long-term survival five, 10, 15 years after transplant has improved uh, significantly over the last two decades. And this is based on the statistical analysis shown on the bottom. But if you focus on the bottom, what you really should be thinking about is, well, that's all well and good, Dr. Mannon, but what about graft survival? And yes, over the last two decades, we've seen a significant improvement in median survival, meaning the sort of center, the average of, of deceased donor survival, we've gone from about eight years to almost 12 years. And for living donors, about 12 years to about 19. That's a positive improvement, don't get me wrong. But if I were a patient and I were facing maybe 12 years as the average survival of my deceased donor transplant, I would be concerned, particularly with the expectation of life expectancy being in the 70s and 80s. Some of the, our patients may have to look at two, three or four transplants, and that's not optimal. So in addition, we need to think about what the barriers are. And, and, and an additional barrier to this general concept is the notion of the industry. And I would say that part of the blame here is on, on industry, not our industry colleagues that are dedicated to transplant, but their leadership. The return on investment for therapeutics in our field is low. We're not erectile dysfunction. We're not hypertension. We're not diabetes. We're not going to be blockbuster drugs that are going to return billions of dollars to the company. We're a small field. And as I'll point out again and again, our study endpoints really leave very little room for error and they require large patient populations. And finally, with the notion that uh, general that our practitioners feel that we can't do any better, um, or the marginal improvement with a new drug is, is really just small, would we want to challenge the current dogma of the current standard immunosuppressive therapy? And finally, there are regulatory issues, and that's going to be the focus of the rest of my talk, that when we develop drugs, we use a specific endpoint of biopsy-proven rejection and patient and graft survival. 
And based on those specific endpoints, it makes it nearly impossible to develop drugs that are going to show improvement over the current situation, which as I've shown you is really quite good, but not excellent. So when we undergo, when, when companies undergo and consider drug approvals, the typical way it works is that you have a comparator arm trial. You don't do an observation, you can do observational cohort studies, but you can't get labeled by the FDA. You have to have a comparator. And the comparator arm typically is mycophenolic mofetil, prednisone, and tacrolimus. And I would say that those three drugs were considered the comparator only in 2008, which is why the Bilatacept trials that were approved in 2011 and 12 had uh, cyclosporin, and because at the time the slot, those trials were designed, that was the FDA approved combination. But the current combination is what many of you are on, probably about 80% of you. And the current endpoints for drug approval, which have been stand the test of time for decades, are biopsy proven rejection and patient and graft survival at one year. So using this information, it, the new branded therapeutic has to be non-inferior. I mean, it can't be worse than the current therapy for safety, efficacy and safety based on the current ways things are approved. And it's almost impossible to show superiority because our outcomes are so good. Biopsy proven rejection occurs between five and 8% for most patients and patient and graft survival are in the mid to upper 90s. These endpoints were great in the 1980s and 70s when transplant was relatively new and probably in the, up until the mid 1990s. But the current therapeutic combination has been effective, at least for these primary endpoints. But these endpoints don't facilitate therapy. And as I've already said, it's infrequent to see rejection. And so in order to design a trial, it's impractical. You have to have massive numbers. And I mean thousands of patients. And that means going outside the US to engage multiple countries to make um, the study size sufficient. And again, I, not only is acute rejection uncommon, but acute rejection, you know, two decades ago, sure, it was linked to late graft loss, but it isn't anymore. In fact, the earlier rejections and the way we treat them, even if they're uncommon, they're not linked to long-term graft survival. Bilatacept is a great example of this. The drug trial had very low, had higher rejection rates than the control, but long-term follow-up studies of patients in those initial trials has indicated that those patients' grafts have survived longer than the standard of care and have better graft function. And also on a practical perspective, if you were in a trial, would you be able to be on the study drug for 10 years? Would you be willing to wait? And would the public be willing to wait to see that outcome? And so we can't practically do a trial and wait 10 years to see the outcome. Things would never move. They already move slowly enough. So I think the final point I have is that late graph failure is tough. It's multifactorial in its nature. I've studied it for most of my career. And so that I would say that a single marker um, it, you know, early in post-transplant period would not be really suitable to predict long-term graft loss. And so we really need to be knowledgeable about how to predict long-term graft failure and develop our drugs around that particular endpoint. So what's happened, uh, and we've had this conversation, this is a new information. In 2017, the Transplantation Society met um, in Arlington, Virginia after an FDA workshop, and we talked about endpoints predictive of graft loss recognizing that there are no FDA recognized surrogate endpoints for late graft failure. And we talked about the different terms, prognostic, predictive, and we talked about examples like estimated GFR and proteinuria, which are prognostic but not predictive, donor HLA antibody, which is important, but we couldn't come to an agreement of how to measure it exactly. And also that pathology in and of itself is important, but some histologic patterns are not specific. And so we, we talked a lot about how could we come to an endpoint predictive of graft loss. So why does this matter? Because other therapeutic areas like cancer and HIV have been accelerated and changed dramatically through something called accelerated drug approval pathway or subpart H. This is now part of US law. It's part of the 21st Century Cures Act, which was passed in 2015. And for example, about 278 drugs have been approved this way by the FDA over about a 20 year period. And again, I say that it re I think it really revolutionized cancer therapy where the surrogate was progression sur free survival. And indeed, if you look at the literature, about 100 drugs were approved for cancer indications through 2017 using this pathway. 
I would point out that the literature is also showing that maybe the long-term overall patient benefit in survival is only about 20%. But when you talk to oncologists and when you do research in the area, about 40% feel that the approvals are considered high therapeutic value and have extended patients' lives for a period of time. But I would point out that transplant has never been able to use the accelerated approval pathway. First and foremost, I'll reiterate that we don't have validated markers to serve as surrogate endpoints. There's also a hesitancy on the part of the regulatory agency to support this pathway. They're concerned about post-approval confirmation, which has not been strong, as I've pointed out, in other fields. And I think there's also a generalized hesitancy that they don't see kidney disease and kidney failure and transplant along the same lines as cancer, that they feel perhaps that the ability to sustain and survive on dialysis is sufficient. And we know with the data that I've shown you that it is not acceptable. So in 2017, after nearly five years of working on this, which was something I started when I was president of the American Society of Transplantation, we created the Transplant Therapeutic Consortium. Shown here are some of the initial members of the consortium with founding members of the American Society of Transplant and the American Society of Transplant uh, Surgeons. Again, this is part of the uh, Critical Path Institute. It's a private-public partnership with the Food and Drug Administration. And they have extensive experience with other therapeutic disease areas, including polycystic kidney disease, TB treatment, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and the like. And we thought this would be an opportunity to focus on kidney transplant to help us develop new therapies. And that was specifically um, uh, in our launch statement about accelerating discovery for our patients. So we did have a public workshop back in 2018, as shown here. Um, this was developed in concert with FDA, the TTC, and the public. And it was really to identify biomarkers um, on day one to improve a drug development outcome. And this is the manuscript that came from that meeting. And this was part of that workshop. These were all the biomarkers that we talked about and how they would be used, the so-called context of use, if they were used in a trial and used to be developing new therapy. And there was really strong evidence presented uh, at that meeting for the integrative box or IBOX as a reasonably likely surrogate endpoint to predict long-term allograft survival and could be utilized to enroll patients for novel immunosuppression to help identify new drugs that would improve long-term survival outcomes. So the TTC has been working on the IBOX as a reasonably likely surrogate endpoint. What is it? it there's now a lot of published data. It's a multi-parameter composite score prognostic of late graft survival. It has eight factors associated with the outcome. They include histology. So somewhere within your first year of a trial, for example, you would need to have a biopsy. And those are the subscores that we use in the BAMP allograft pathology scheme. Um, we would need to measure whether you have donor-specific antibody, HLA, DSA. We would also use the measures of proteinuria and estimated GFR. Now, each of these is independently associated with graft failure and particularly estimated GFR, level of kidney function and proteinuria. But when you combine all of these um, items together, the risk prediction story does a very, very good job. I'll admit it's not 100% predictive, but it's really very strongly correlated to graft outcome and graft failure. So the use of this IBOX, we would suggest, would be the possibility to perform a one-year superiority trial put a drug in with the comparator arm and show that you could improve this score and, it, and it therefore predict that patients would do better for long-term outcome. And we believe in the organizations that this is an opportunity to entice industry back to re-engage and utilize new therapies in transplantation. I would say as a secondary endpoint, it would not likely be helpful. It would not overcome the financial obstacles of drug development because those trials wouldn't be newly designed. They would be the same old thing of showing safety and tolerability as the primary endpoint. So again, the IBOX would be facilitated as a potential co-primary endpoint. I just wanna show some of the data that has been worked on. This is a summary slide showing all the data sets that have been accumulated. Importantly, in addition to the data provided by the IBOX individuals from the Parish Transplant Consortium of over 4,000 patients, both industry has provided patients in trial data, 
as well as individual transplant centers that maintain their own transplant registry, particularly the Mayo Clinic and in Helsinki, as well as Houston Methodist. I'd be remiss in not including those. But you can see that several thousand patients' data has been harmonized in a massive data set in order to investigate and do the statistical analysis required by FDA to evaluate IBOX in these different settings to be predictive of the patient outcomes. So I want to just summarize the regulatory sub, uh, submission timeline so you know we've already had success on the, uh, the European Medicines Agency shown on the bottom. We started working with them to consider the IBOX as an endpoint. The EMA does not have any transplant endpoints that are transplant specific. And in December 2022, we received the final approval from the EMA. It's considered a secondary endpoint, but for the first time, there's actually an endpoint in specific for transplantation. So really a success in Europe in terms of therapeutic design. In the U.S., we've had a much longer pathway, as you can see. We started in 2018 with that workshop, and we've slowly moved forward. Um, with a regulatory pathway that even I have been challenged by. Um, and I do work in the federal agency, so I know about um, regulation, but it's been really challenging. And in July, this past July, we did submit our phase three qualification plan. And I want to thank the AAKP for submitting a, a strong letter of support uh, for this submission to FDA in the hopes of getting a positive FDA response to continue our work. So with that, I just want to summarize and give you some takeaways. I think the lack of therapeutic innovation in transplant during my course of my career is startling. And in fact, sometimes I reflect, why did I even go into this field? I really felt so dedicated and excited and, and really seeing the tremendous changes that transplant makes on a patient's life with kidney failure as well as other diseases. But this lack of innovation is really disappointing and startling at the same time. There really are barriers to drug development, and you can point fingers at everybody, including our own practitioners' attitudes, um, our industry, as well as the regulatory obstacles which we are trying to overcome right now. There's opportunity ahead to have the IBOX replace the antiquated endpoints for new drug development and reinvigorate the field. And while IBOX may not be perfect, it certainly is a substantial move forward from what we currently use, which as I point out, has been in place for decades. And finally, patients deserve better and you have to demand progress. It's easy for me as a physician to be uh, a staunch advocate for you, but I think that having the voices of the patient are really critical at this juncture. And again, want to reiterate the support of the AAKP for the IBOX as a reasonably likely surrogate endpoint in kidney transplant trials. And with that, I will end my presentation and thank the organization for inviting me to participate in this important meeting. Thank you very much, Dr. Manon. As we will with Dr. Potter, we look forward to working with you in your efforts for transplant patients and in transplant innovation, and we'll be strong allies in that effort. Our next two speakers come to us from the University of California, Davis, where they are recognized experts in issues related to payment and financial issues surrounding transplantation. Our first speaker is Annette Needham. And she serves as the transplant quality manager at UC Davis Health Transplant Center. She's also on the board of directors of NATCO, the Organization for Donation and Transplant Professionals, which is a longtime allied organization of AAKP. She will be joined by Sheena Glover, who serves as the transplant financial coordinator and supervisor for the UC Davis Health Transplant Center. Now, Annette and Sheena have great expertise on issues that are important to us as patients as we consider transplant as an option, and they've seen it all. Their expertise is of particular interest to us as we go through the implementation of the benefit that we work so hard for, which is immunosuppressive drug coverage for the life of the transplant patient if a patient runs into issues related to the continuity of their insurance and payment for their transplant drugs. So without further ado, Annette and Sheena, it's great to have you. Thank you, Paul, for that introduction, and thank you to AAKP for having us for this talk. We're going to talk to you today um, about Under the Dome issues and policies impacting patients related to the immunosuppressant drug coverage bill. So per my introduction from Paul, my main experience in transplant has been as a transplant coordinator, mostly in kidney transplants. 
I have also been a NATCO board member for the past four years and have worked on a lot of projects for them with the Organ Procurement Transplantation Network, the OPTN, who make all of the transplant policies for professionals. NATCO is a professional organization made up of clinical and procurement transplant coordinators and transplant dietitians. They are the leaders in the education of transplant professionals and also get involved with initiatives such as this amino suppression bill to help support needed items for our transplant patients. Today, I would like to go over the history of Medicare as it relates to the coverage of these immunosuppressive medications and talk about the introduction of the immunosuppression bill. I will also discuss briefly the differences and benefits of the roles of the transplant coordinator and the financial coordinator in transplant programs. So back in 1973, if you had a diagnosis of kidney failure, but otherwise did not meet age or disability requirements for Medicare, you became Medicare eligible because of the kidney failure. Back then, there were only about 2,000 kidney transplants being performed, and the emphasis was more on dialysis to sustain life versus transplants. In 1986, the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act, OBRA, authorized payment for immunosuppressive medications for one year after a Medicare-covered kidney transplant. This was covered under Part B in 1986, but again, only for one year. The thought was that patients would recover from their surgery and return to work with insurance to pay for their medication. In 1984, a National Organ Transplant Act was passed, referred to as NOTA, which authorized, among many things, the establishment of the Organ Procurement Transplantation Network and the creation of the Scientific Registry for Organ Transplantation SRTR. And why is this important? This act actually sets the stage for many changes to come in transplants, including the management of the waitlist by UNOS, the United Network for Organ Sharing, and establishing organ recovery organizations known as OPOs, and also making a valuable consideration for organs outlawed. In 1993, the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act, again OBRA, helped stage an extension of immunosuppression coverage from one to three years, which was phased in over the next several years. This was done because the success of transplantation was continuing to improve, and dialysis was much more expensive than transplant and also gave patients a much better quality of life. The cost of medications was so high that patients often found themselves unable to secure insurance coverage, unable to afford these transplant preserving medications, and therefore they faced rejection or failure and ultimate return to dialysis. In 2009, the Immuno Bill was included in the House Amendment to the Affordable Care Act, but the offset to pay for it involved bundled reimbursement for outpatient medications for patients on dialysis, so it was actually not included in the final past legislation. Over the next many years, different organizations and transplant professionals attempted multiple ways to address the issue and change legislation, including journal articles, calls to action, revisions and multiple submissions of the bill, and surveys of transplant centers and their patients. NATCO specifically participated in the Honor the Gift campaign and supported a grassroots effort to have our members campaign in favor of passing the bill. Transplant organizations provided information on everything from quality of life, lower cost of generic medications, and even that failure to preserve the organ was disrespectful to the families who had lost a loved one to donate the organ. Other countries, such as the UK, Canada, and Australia, had long-term survival rates consistently higher than the US, as they did provide lifetime access to immunosuppressive drugs to all of their kidney transplant patients. It was not until November of 2020, after 20 years of advocacy, that the United States Congress passed the Comprehensive Immunosuppression Drug Coverage for Kidney Transplant Patients Act, indefinitely extending Medicare coverage of immunosuppressive medications for kidney transplant patients only. I wanted to just spend a minute or two on the many important roles of staff at transplant centers. Most patients are very much aware of the role of transplant coordinators as they are typically their first contact at the center. They are usually registered nurses or nurse practitioners and they guide the patient through the evaluation process. They are always available to answer questions during the long wait. 
Even after transplant, the coordinator assigned may change at some point, but they continue to be the lifeline for many transplant patients. As I mentioned before, there are other important roles in the transplant center. One that most patients are familiar with is the financial coordinator. The financial coordinators do a lot of work in the background with the insurance companies, screening and working with them on team coverage. They also talk to the patient about their individual coverage and what gaps they may have and help them overcome this. I would now like to pass this talk along to our financial coordinator supervisor, Sheena, here at UC Davis, who will continue with more specific information about how patients can navigate this relatively new bill. Thank you, Annette, for that amazing history lesson. As mentioned in my introduction, my name is Sheena Glover. I am a certified transplant financial coordinator at UC Davis Transplant Center. I've been in my role for almost 12 years, and I'm also a member of the Transplant Financial Coordinators Association. Today, I would like to discuss the implementation of the immunosuppressant drug coverage benefit and dive into the essential things that you should know as a patient. So here are our key topics that we will touch on today. I would like to go over Medicare entitlement due to end-stage renal disease, what to know about the immunosuppressant drug coverage, who qualifies, who does not qualify, what is covered versus what is not covered, what patients and physicians can do to prepare for this, and also I would like to provide additional education and helpful tips. So Medicare entitlement because of end-stage renal disease. First, I want to start with this subject to ensure everyone knows how Medicare works because of end-stage renal disease. It's very important to know how you qualify for Medicare, if you qualify for Medicare, and if you are eligible for Medicare, because there are a couple of ways that you can qualify. So patients who are either on dialysis or starting dialysis or have received a kidney transplant have entitlement to Medicare, regardless of their age. And also, if you do qualify for Medicare, let's say if you are someone that's under the age of 65 or maybe you don't have enough working quarters, that those are key factors to also know. So if you have worked the required amount of time under Social Security, which is 40 working quarters, which is equivalent to 10 years, you can qualify. If you are getting or eligible for Social Security, you will qualify. You are a spouse or a dependent child of a person meeting those requirements listed then you would definitely qualify. What's covered under Medicare? So Medicare Part A covers all inpatient services. So inpatient care in a hospital, if you need to go to a skilled nursing facility, nursing home care, home hospice, or home health care, this will be covered under your Medicare Part A. Part A is usually free to everyone. You can qualify for a free premium program. Medicare Part B, as in boy, covers all outpatient services. So doctor's visits, outpatient medical services, durable medical equipment, and then also most important, the immunosuppressant medications. Part B does come with a premium and it will vary based on your income. Depending on your secondary insurance, it will pick up the premium for Part B. Keep in mind when you have Medicare due to end-stage renal disease, you will lose your Medicare 36 months after a successful kidney transplant. So if you need help with applying for Medicare, please work with your dialysis center, your nephrologist, or your transplant financial coordinator. They can definitely assist you with applying for Medicare. What to know about the immunosuppressant drug coverage, also known as Medicare Part B ID. So this drug coverage is something new that was just passed. So this offers additional coverage to our patients who are eligible and qualify for Medicare. So any patients that are eligible for Medicare Part B ID starting after October 1st, 2022, you are able to apply. So after this time, you are eligible, you can enroll and disenroll at any time without any penalties. This new benefit helps you pay for your immunosuppressant drug coverage beyond the 36 months. So that means those who have had a transplant whose Medicare eligibility expires before, on, or after January 1st, 2023 will be eligible for this coverage. And again, it provides additional extended coverage for your immunosuppressant drugs. So let's get into who is eligible to enroll. So in order for you to qualify for this new benefit, patients eligible for Medicare Part B ID must have or previously had Medicare because of end-stage renal disease, which ends at 36 months after a successful kidney transplant. 
Patients will need to have Medicare Part A and B at the time of transplant to be eligible for this new benefit. In my experience, patients aren't always aware that they have to have Medicare Part A and B at the time of transplant. So make sure you have Part A and B at the time of transplant. Also, patients who are not currently enrolled in any other insurance health plan that offers immunosuppressant drug coverage will be eligible for this plan. Keep in mind that Part B deductible and the 20% copay still applies, so you will still be responsible to pay your copay. So who is not eligible? So it's important to know this because not everyone will be eligible. So if you are someone who has an employer group insurance or an individual plan through the marketplace, you will not qualify for this extended coverage. If you have TRICARE, Medicaid, or Children's Health Insurance Program, also known as CHIP, you will not qualify for this extended coverage. Anyone who has VA coverage insurance and you have eligibility to get your immunosuppressive drugs covered at the VA, you will not qualify. So please keep in mind that if any of these apply to you, you will not qualify for the extended coverage. It is also important to know if you qualify, but then later get other coverage as mentioned above the TRICARE employer group insurance, you must end your Medicare Part B ID benefits. You can do so by notifying Social Security within 60 days of the enrollment of the coverage. What is covered versus what is not covered? Medicare Part B ID benefits cover continuous immunosuppressive drugs, which are medically necessary for preventing or treating the rejection of a transplanted organ or tissue. This benefit provides coverage indefinitely no matter your age or disability. Obviously, you'll have Medicare Part A and B, but keep in mind that this benefit does not cover any other Part A, Part B, or Part D services, supplies, or medications like antibiotics, vitamins, other drugs not directly related to the organ. So what can you do as a patient or what can your physician do as a patient to prepare? Uh, my recommendation for the physicians, I always stress to our providers at our transplant centers and our local nephrologists, it is important to educate the patients, you guys, always on what they qualify for. So if your patients qualify for this new benefit, please express to them that they can apply. If they're unsure of how to apply, please have them contact their transplant financial coordinator. Also with dialysis centers, because the dialysis centers, they are with the patients more than anyone. The patients, you know, you guys are seen three times a week sometimes for dialysis. So it's important for the social workers, even the financial counselors at the dialysis centers to educate you all on if you qualify or not. As a patient, my recommendation to you, contact your financial coordinator and establish a relationship with them if you have not done so already. The financial coordinators will help educate and guide you through the process. And if you're someone who's proactive and enjoy doing your own research, you can visit the Medicare website on your own and do your own research and further educate yourself. So just a few helpful tips for you all. As mentioned by Annette, there are many important roles in the transplant center, the financial coordinators being one of them. Please make sure that you know who your financial coordinator is, reach out to them and discuss your insurance benefits to see if you will qualify for the extended coverage. The financial coordinator will help educate and guide you on what is needed to qualify for this new benefit post-transplant. To apply, you can contact your social security office directly Remember that your Medicare will expire 36 months after a successful transplant. I know that I've mentioned that several times in this talk, but it's important because a lot of patients aren't aware that they will lose their Medicare 36 months after a successful kidney transplant. So once you get close to your 36 month, you will receive a letter from Medicare stating that your Medicare will be expiring soon. I would recommend at that point that you contact Social Security to see if you can either apply then or if you actually have to wait until your Medicare has expired. If you have to wait until your Medicare has expired, please make sure you contact your transplant pharmacist to ensure that you have enough medication to cover until your extended coverage has become active. And remember that the Medicare Part B ID only provides coverage for the immunosuppressive drugs and no other services or medications. And again, you're still responsible for the 20% copay. I think it's always important to educate ourselves. You know, we go through the process of being a kidney transplant patient for a long time. So it's important that you educate yourself early on, even if you have, you know, a couple years before you receive your transplant, it's important. 
um, I stress that you reach out to your transplant financial coordinator. They are the experts. They have direct contact with the transplant pharmacist, so they can definitely help you walk you through this process, even log on to the computer and walk you through on how you can apply. Um, again, reach out to your financial coordinator and they will help you walk you through this process. Thank you, Paul and AAKP for having us. Um, I hope you all find this information informative and take advantage of the extended coverage offered to you. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of our speakers for being part of Under the Dome here on our first day. We'll have our second session of Under the Dome tomorrow. Again, you have a tremendous amount of expertise here. These sessions will be available to view afterwards, and we encourage you to follow us closely because each of the speakers that you heard from is a very good ally of AAKP and a staunch advocate for patients and those who are struggling to get a transplant and maintain it. So again, thank you very much for joining this session of Under the Dome.